HQ presented by Caesar Sportsbook. I'm Chris Hassel. We are about to pick every week 14 game against the spread. Brady Quinn is standing by heading into the final month of the regular season. And home favorites continue to struggle. They've covered the spread just 40% of the time. That does not bode well for the Vikings, who kick off the week Thursday at home. Three-point favorites against the Steelers. Our Tommy Tran has more. Week 14 in the NFL kicks off in Minnesota with the Vikings hosting the Steelers. It's a matchup neither team can afford to lose if they have any hopes of reaching the playoffs. It's been an up and down year in Pittsburgh. Other than a four game win streak after the first month of the season, they've had several head scratching performances, including giving up 40 plus points in back to back weeks. And down versus the Ravens in week 13 of the fourth quarter, it was Big Ben who led them to a desperately needed win late in what was rumored to be his final year as a Steeler. My focus is on Minnesota and what we have to do to get ready. I'll address any of that stuff after the season. I've always been a one game at a time, one season at a time person, and I'm gonna stay that way. For the Vikings, week 13 was supposed to be a get right spot against the winless Lions. Instead, they gave up a walk off touchdown at the buzzer, one of several late game leads they've let get away from them this season. We'll have a short week now and uh, gotta move forward. This one obviously, you know, hurts. Gotta learn from it move forward. The time is now for both of these teams. Can the Vikings start closing out games, or will Big Ben rally the squad in his potential swan song with the Steelers? Week 14 is about to get underway. All right, and we are moving forward without Pete Prisco. We That's wish him well. He's fine health-wise. Claims he's uh, doing jury, jury duty. Jury duty. I actually think he's probably on the beach right now. That's why he's always got that nice, solid base yeah, tan. I just, I just can't imagine, you know, lawyers saying, you know what, I want that guy on my jury, right? He's the last person that if I was an attorney <laughs> I know, right, and crazy. I have to litigate, that I want to look at that guy across the room and see if I can persuade him. Can that's the, that's the, I mean, he's as stubborn as it gets. Oh, I yeah. mean, he's get off my front yard, Pete Prisco. How could you possibly select him to be a part of a jury? That's why nobody believes him when he says he's stuck in jury duty. So that's Brady Quinn. I'm Chris Hassel. It's just going to be uh, Brady picking games. We will show you Pete's picks this week. He's not here to explain his picks. Also not here for his spinning top of the week. Wah, wah. Uh, both of you guys 500 last week, 7-7. Seven and seven. You had a great start, Brady, and then it tailed off. It tailed there. off. It really did. It was disappointing to watch the, the <laughs> tailspin that was last weekend set of games. However, it wasn't a losing week, but I got to start gaining ground on Pete. And the problem yeah. is this week, he's not here to, to defend this, but I always get my picks in before him. Mm -hmm. A lot of copying going on. So I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to kind of save this lead and agree as much as possible so he maintains that lead going into the final week. We're thinking that maybe we'll just give you the picks this week, give you a chance to catch up to Pete there the last go. couple weeks there of the season. Go. So we're starting with Steelers and Vikings. This is the Thursday night game. This is tied for the highest total at 52 and a half. And I think it will hit the over, in part because I can't really trust the Vikings defense with what we saw down the stretch versus Detroit. Give Dan Campbell and that team a ton of credit. We'll talk about them in a little bit. But the bottom line is this Vikings offense can score. Kirk Cousins is having a phenomenal year. If Dalvin Cook plays, great. If not, Alexander Madison has, has played well in his place. But I do have concerns about that Vikings defense stopping a Pittsburgh Steelers offense that seemed anemic at times last week, but then got it going when they needed to with Ben Roethlisberger to Deontay Johnson, a big play to Claypool, too, down the stretch so I do think there'll be a high amount of scoring in this one but if I have to pick between these two teams which their season's on the line look I wrote off Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago and I still don't think they're going to be end up making it to the postseason that's why I've got the Minnesota Vikings and I'll lay the three points here Ben Roethlisberger finally an underdog against a team under 500 that long streak should be coming to an end this week Vikings three-point favorites at home we mentioned at the top of the show home favorites hitting just 40% of the time against the spread. Road dogs have been hitting. Let's move on to Sunday's games. The Cowboys taking on Washington. Dallas, you know, they've had a stranglehold on the division pretty much the entire season. Washington, they've put together a winning streak. If they could somehow pull this out, it's going to be a race to the finish. And how about Taylor Haneke? The way yeah. he has played so far, in particular during this win streak, if you call it, or even climbing back up into the NFC playoff picture, he's added a different element with his ability to take off and run at times to this offense, outside of their playmakers, guys like Antonio Gibson, who you can't get the football to enough, it's been Heineke that's really started to lead them this way. So you know, the defense, the pass coverage in particular was awful at times. It started to improve and gotten better. And that's really the question is, what's the Dallas Cowboys pass game going to look like? It seems like it's inconsistent from time to time. We heard from Jerry Jones earlier this week talking about, hey, don't put it all on Dak. 
It's the receivers. Sometimes those guys are off by a yard or two in their routes and it messes up the concept or messes up the timing of the play. So we'll see which Dallas team decides to show up. Given that this one's on the road, a divisional matchup, I'm going to go ahead and take the four points and the hot team right now. Even though Dallas does have some additional rest and I think they're, they're more talented team, I think the Washington football team keeps this one close. Give me the four points, and I do think this will be a higher scoring game, uh, at least over the 48 points that we've got for the over-under. Washington's won four straight, and a lot of this has come with without their maybe their best player, uh, their best defensive player for sure. How do you explain the turnaround? Uh, I think sometimes an interesting thing is when one of your best players go out, it presents another opportunity, but other guys feel the pressure to step up in his plays. And obviously without Chase Young, who's a dynamic player, they still have a lot of first-round picks amongst that defensive front. So it's not like they don't still have an embarrassment of riches up front. Those guys have stepped up and they've done a good job. And I think, look, give Ron Rivera a lot of credit too for believing in Taylor Henneke. Because as much as this is about other guys stepping up on defense, it's also about the defense believing in what Taylor Henneke's doing on offense and their offense doing their part playing complimentary football. Uh, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of copying going on between you and Pete this week, even though Pete's gone. Uh, you also both like Washington after you both liked uh, the Vikings to cover the three in the Thursday night game. Let's move on to a, a game between five and seven teams. Loser might be uh, kaput in the playoff race. Winner still has an opportunity. It's the Falcons and the Panthers, and the Panthers are giving three at home with Cam Newton. I'm going to go ahead and take those three points. I mean, the bottom line is these two football teams aren't playing good football right now. And, and if I'm going to bet on one of the two, I still think Matt Ryan with the numbers he can put up. Kyle Pitts, who it feels like he's hitting a bit of a rookie wall right now. But as long as Cordero Patterson's a part of this game, the way he's run the football, the way he's catching the football in the backfield for Atlanta, it gives me hope, and I'll take the three points uh, because I do think these are two evenly matched teams. Now, the problem is, is I'm a little bit concerned about that offensive line for Atlanta taking on a pass rush and a defense that can get after opponents. But I don't really have much faith in the Carolina Panthers, as bad as the Falcons' defense has been, being able to put up many points in this one. So I think it's a, a low over-under at 42.5. I think it hits the over. I think you'll see a, a lot of scoring between the Falcons and Panthers. But bottom line is I'll take the three points with two evenly matched teams like this. Panthers fired offensive coordinator Joe Brady. His stock was so, so high Coming into the a few season. weeks ago. Well, really, I mean, when Sam Darnold got off to that good start. After what, what the happened? first quarter of the season, I, I think the hard thing was is then you ended up not having Christian McCaffrey, who was you know, by far and away your best playmaker on offense for a period of time. Uh, that hurts. They don't have him, obviously, now the rest of the season. And Sam Darnold's play started to tail off a little bit. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you learn when you come to the NFL level is once there's a book out on you, and that could be a, for a player or a coach, people start to see your tendencies. And I think that started to play a factor there, too. Obviously, the lack of play at the quarterback position. The offensive line didn't play as well at times. I mean, they've been Pete Prisco spinning top as a group, I want to say, at least once, if not one player on their offensive line another time throughout the course of the season. So, it was the sum of the parts, but the bottom line is Joe Brady's going to have many opportunities. Mm. He's a young play caller at the college level, NFL level. I don't think that these are his last days calling plays in the NFL. You think he resurfaces college or NFL? Player? I think he'll resurface in college. He's a hot commodity down there. I think you could still sell the success he had at LSU. I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't end up at the University of Miami with their new hire, Mario Cristobal. Uh, they've devoted extra money to Pam, and coming from the NFL level, it's going to take a pretty penny, but that'd be a place I keep an eye on. Okay, another 1 o'clock Eastern time game for Brady. By the way, what did Pete have on that one? He had the he Panthers in the under. So oh, we're, we're on polar so, opposites okay. here. Okay. I'll speak for him. This is a home game pick, because if you get out the quarterback scales like Pete likes to do, Matt yeah. Ryan. I mean, yeah. at least as far as how he's playing this year in comparison to Cam. Okay, let's move on to the, the Seahawks and the Texans. You can use your quarterback scales here. Uh, Russell Wilson finally had a good game since he came back from that finger injury, but the Seahawks did lose uh, Jamal Adams for the season. Which is a bigger loss than I think a lot of people want to give them credit. I mean, he's, he's third on the team in tackles, has a couple of interceptions this year. He's one of the better blitzing uh, secondary defenders. So it does take away an element to a defense that has struggled mightily. Uh, it's going to be hard to replace. Now, this won't be that matchup that you're overly concerned by. The Texans have a hard time scoring points. And, and as you touched on, you know, last week, Russell Wilson, he started to get a better feel for that finger and how it feels. 30 of 37, he was efficient in the passing game. I think Shane Waldron started to get a better feel for him, too, uh, as, as what he feels comfortable with throwing right now. I think the only thing standing in the Seahawks' way is maybe Gerald Everett and not turning the football over three times like we saw last week. So I'll gladly uh, lay the seven and a half points. Kind of a big number. This line has gone down a little bit uh, since it opened. But I think it's the under. I don't think that see the Texans scoring much. The Seahawks defense will have a good day in replace 
of Jamal Adams, and Russell Wilson starts to get back on track again. All right, that would be a second straight win for Seattle, but a long way to go, even if they just want to get back to close to 500 this season. I, I don't think Russell Wilson's ever had a season where he's been at 500 or no, below. I think it's 9-7 and seven and above every single season. Let's recap the picks from some of the early games. The game's not on CBS, 1 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday, as well as that Thursday night game. Again, Pete Prisco not with us this week. He's with us in spirit, though. A lot of agreement between Brady and Pete. The only disagreement against the spread so far is on that uh, Falcons-Panthers game. Brady likes the Falcons plus three. Pete is on the Carolina Panthers minus three at home. CBS games. We've got a lot of really good games on CBS uh, early and late. Big one between the Ravens and the Browns. The Chiefs looking to keep that winning streak going at home against a Raiders team that's up and down every single week. And the Titans uh, continue to, to get back on track. And the Saints trying to snap a long losing streak. They are at the Jets. So let's start them with Brady Quinn here. The Browns at home, two and a half point favorites in this game against a team they're chasing in the division. They're chasing everybody in the division right now. It, it's a must win for Cleveland. It's a must win for Cleveland. They should be well rested, right? We, we know Baker Mayfield's been banged up, and, and hopefully he's gotten some rest and can recoup right now. Uh, but it's a tough defense to go up against. I mean, the Baltimore Ravens can get after opposing quarterbacks. Their secondary has kind of concerned me with the way they've played. Marlon Humphrey now is out for the rest of the season. Uh, coming into the season, especially earlier this year, he's been their best cornerback, but even he's started to fall by the wayside. So I do think there'll be an opportunity here for the Browns to put up a lot of points. That's why I like the over in this game, because I think both offenses will be able to score. And on the other side, you've got to have some questions if you're a fan of the Baltimore Ravens and what's happened this offense of late. Lamar Jackson has struggled, even though historically he's been really good against the Browns. It just seems like there's a disconnect in the passing game. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe they're going to look back and question the two-point conversion call by John Harbaugh last week in Pittsburgh, but given the issues at the cornerback position, uh, I can understand why he went that way. Bottom line is, it's a tough group and offense to prepare for in what Lamar Jackson presents. Cleveland has not matched up well with him in the past, and that's why if you're going to spot me two and a half points, I'll gladly take it. I think these two teams are pretty close when it all shakes out, but High scoring game, at least over 42 and a half. And I'll take the points with the Baltimore Ravens. Weird scheduling quirk here with the, the Browns playing the Ravens in back to back games in the bye week in between. Have you, did you ever have that as a player? No, never had anything like that. And, and honestly, with the divisional opponent, there's a lot of things that you're familiar with already. So you're going to make a little bit of changes. It just makes it easier for you as far as remembering personnel if you're the Browns here, right? You didn't have anything in between. So you're focusing essentially on the same opponent. And then what little variations you want to make between now and then. All right, Brady's on the Ravens plus two and a half. Pete's on the other side of things. He likes your Browns at minus two and a half, not only to win, but to cover as well. Another early CBS game. I uh, talked to Charles Davis earlier in the week. He's going to be on the call for this one with Iron Eagle and company. Chiefs minus nine and a half at home against the Raiders. Kansas City winning in, in with their defense. I mean, and that's a strange way, you know, going into the season. Patrick Mahomes hasn't thrown a touchdown pass either of the last two games. Yeah, and it concerns me because this one you're looking at saying, well, that's a big spread. I mean, divisional game, how can I lay that? We, we saw the Raiders last year be able to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. They can go blow for blow and hang around. Waller didn't play last week, which I think hurt them a little bit, uh, the Raiders in that loss. But if you're looking at these two teams – uh, I just something tells me the Raiders will be able to hang in this one close enough. Kansas City's had a really hard time separating from teams. And in part two, because of how teams are playing Patrick Mahomes now, a lot more soft zone covers. Now, we didn't see that quite as much from Denver last week because they have the cornerbacks to match up, but few do in the NFL. So this will be back to a lot of more soft zone, more too high looks. That's going to force Kansas City to want to run the football, throw the football. I, I think that and really work their way down the field. That's going to shorten this game. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm on the side of the Raiders here. And look, Derek Carr, once again, put together a pretty good season. I mean, statistically speaking, he's been able to hang in there. So the question will be if they can protect him well enough. I think Derek Carr and the Raiders can make enough big plays to keep this one close, at least within the nine and a half. I do think it'll be the highest scoring game as well, uh, at least enough to hit the, the over on the 48 and a half. And Pete agrees with you. You see what they've done as underdogs this season. And Raiders are that weird team that they lose the games you think they're going to win last week against Washington, and they win the games that you assume they're going to lose. So this is a big number for this kind of team. Well, and last week, again, understandable considering what they're missing now offensively, why they'd have a hard time you know, scoring more points. And, and you'd have to give their defense credit for the way they kind of shut down the Washington football team. But this is a week, again, where I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities for Derek Carr to work those matchups on the outside as long as the pressure doesn't get to him. 
which Chris Jones on the interior, Melvin Ingram, Frank Clark, I mean, all these pieces across the front for Kansas City have made a big-time difference, in particular since Melvin Ingram's gotten there now and since they moved Jones down to the inside. So protection will be pivotal in order for this bet to hit, but I think it's going to. Pete thinks so, too, both on the Raiders plus 9.5 in Kansas City, a game that you can watch early Sunday afternoon, 1 Eastern on CBS, as is the next game, 1 p.m. Eastern on CBS. The Jaguars at the Titans. This has got to be the game where Tennessee finally turns it around. Uh, you'd think that, right? But we've also seen this Jags team be able to beat a Buffalo Bills team, which was a bit surprising. And, and as bad as the Jags have been of late, like this is a divisional opponent. Uh, I do think there's a, a sense of familiarity there. And, and they've struggled offensively to do much, especially with Trevor Lawrence. Something tells me they'll be able to get this one back on track a little bit and, and at least stay within the number. I'm not saying they outright win, but even though Tennessee has struggled, I think this is the game they win, but maybe win close because of the way Jacksonville hangs around. So there's not a ton of logic in this one. I just looked at the line and said, for the way the Tennessee Titans have been playing, that looks a little bit much at this point. So I'm on the side of the Jags. I'm going to take the points. I think they hang around here a little bit. I know Pete's on the other side of this yeah. one. This could end up being the decision maker when it's all said and done. But I'm not buying into necessarily thinking that the Titans are just going to be able to run away with this game. The Titans are heavy favorites here coming off a of bye week, but they got blown out by New England their last time out. They've lost back-to-back -back games. Maybe, maybe that Derrick Henry injury finally catching up with them a little bit. But Pete's on the other side because earlier in the week, yeah. uh, before he went into jury seclusion, yeah. Uh, he said that the Jags, not only are the worst team in the NFL, but they're going to end up with the number one overall pick because they're losing out. Well, again, Pete's got a lot of familiarity with the Jacksonville Jaguars. There's also a lot of love-hate there. So <laughs> yeah, it, right. you can see why he, he gets a little upset about with the new regime, the fact that he hasn't been asked to walk in the door and do a one-on-one -on -one sit-down <laughs> interview. So, uh, is he the, still bitter that Urban won't He talk is to him? as bitter as there's ever been about <laughs> not getting a, a sit-down with their head coach. So that plays a factor into some of his emotions and why he picks what he picks. Uh, but, again, we'll see. That's why these play, they play these games. I think there'll be a different game plan. I think the Jaguars keep this one close. Okay, one more game on CBS, 1 o'clock Eastern time, and it's the New Orleans Saints who continue to struggle. They are going to get Alvin Kamara back yeah. against the Jets. That should be enough to win the game. And God, they need it. I mean, offensively speaking, it's hard watching Taysom Hill back there, and they're trying to make him something that he's not. So you need some other playmakers, some other weapons. Kamara coming back helps take pressure off of Taysom Hill. I think it helps make their rushing attack that much more impactful. But I'm telling you, Sean Payton really needs to give a lot of thought to putting Ian Book in there. They draft him in the fourth round for a reason. The season's starting to fall by the wayside. We know what Taysom Hill is. The four interceptions last week, that, that's going to hurt you every single time you put him out there. Even a Jets team like that, as bad as the Jets have been, they're going to be able to beat you if you turn the football over that much. So the Saints need to hammer away running the football with Kamara, with Taysom Hill as part of that. And if, it, if that doesn't work, then you need to get Ian Book in there and let him play quarterback. But uh, look, the other side of this conversation is the New York Jets. Zach Wilson played some good football last week. Now, he did also throw an awful interception. But I think Robert Sala is starting to get a feel for how this team operates best, what gives him the best chance to win. And he is making strides as a rookie. Now, in this game, I think it's going to be, he's got a tough task going up against that Saints defense. The variation of looks that Dennis Allen's going to give him will be tough. So they better be able to run the football. I don't think they're going to. So I'm laying the five and a half points here. I think the Saints find a way of winning this one comfortably. And Pete Prisco agrees with Brady. A lot of agreement so far as we recap the 1 o'clock Eastern time games on CBS and the picks from Brady and the absent Pete Prisco. Pete likes Brady's Browns disagreement there against the Ravens. Agreement on the Raiders plus 9.5 on the Saints minus 5.5. And uh, Pete thinks the Jags are going to no. lose and lose big. Pete being in jury duty should have enough time to fill out a couple over and unders too. That's true. Yeah, he should. <laughs> he should have more time to look at the total. Says he's too busy for that usually, but not this week. All right. When we come back, we're moving to the late afternoon games, and we've got a couple great ones on CBS, including the struggling Bills and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Caesars Sportsbook, sponsoring our NFL picks and giving us the lines for our Week 14 games. These are the late afternoon games. A couple of them on CBS, and they're both really good matchups. Bills, Bucks, Tampa, only favored by three at home. And the 49ers and Bengals, both those teams in wild card spots right now in their respective conferences. Chris Hassel, Brady Quinn with you. Bills, Bucks. Uh, I think, you know, a, a few weeks ago I'd be saying potential Super Bowl preview. Yeah. Maybe it is. Maybe. But 
Probably not. Buffalo's in some trouble right now. <laughs> they're in a lot of trouble right now. And, and you can tell they're, I don't want to say at a breaking point, but clearly there's some frustration on the defensive side. I mean, Sean McDermott is coming out saying, hey, we shouldn't give too much credit to yeah, Bill Belichick and his odd. staff. That was odd. And I think it was frustrating because of essentially what Bill Belichick and his staff did. They said, we're just going to run the football and see if you can stop it. And Sean McDermott, who's a defensive-minded guy, his defense couldn't adjust. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't stop it versus the Colts a couple of weeks ago when they gave up over 260 yards on the ground and Jonathan Taylor went off. And, and that had nothing to do with weather, by the way. Mm. That was just the fact they couldn't stop the run. In this case, you basically had the New England Patriots with one arm tied behind their back, which they did it to them themselves, only throwing three pass attempts, probably two of which weren't even necessary, mm. and they still couldn't stop the run, gave up over 200 yards. So if I'm the Tampa Bay Bucks. And I'm Bruce Arians. As much as, look, Tom Brady's leading the league in yards and attempts and touchdowns, all that stuff and passing. I am running the ball and running the ball and running the ball until I see if the Buffalo Bills can stop. It's one of the reasons why I like the under in this game. Because even though with the Buffalo Bills passing attack and the secondary for the Bucs has been bad, I still think that the Bucs are going to say, we're just going to play keep away from you guys. We're going to frustrate you and run the ball right down your throat until you figure out whether or not you can stop it. And so for that reason, I'm laying the three points with the Bucs here. I think they're the better team. And I think ultimately that game plan is going to work out until the Bills showcase that they can actually stop someone running the football. Tom Brady's won nine straight against the Buffalo Bills dating back to 2015. Are you surprised at all that Pete Prisco, who, who took the Bills to win the Super Bowl? No, because that's what season, this is about. He, he is, understands how important this game is uh-huh. for his Super Bowl. He's taking Bowl the game. Bills. He's also taking the over. Right. Again, because he thinks the passing game for the Bills will ultimately lead to higher scoring. It'll be better weather. And, and, well, better weather. That's part of it. But he thinks it's probably going to be a shootout between Brady and, and obviously Bruce Arians, who likes to throw the football, and the Bills who are going up against a weaker secondary in the Tampa Bay Bucks. That's what he's playing. And that could very well play out. I just don't see that being the case. I think this is more of a tone-setting game where the Bucks just sat there and watched what the Patriots did and say, yeah, you know what, we're going to run the football too and hammer away with Leonard Fournette, get that going, and see if you can't stop the rushing attack and then build everything off of that. The way that playoff race is in the AFC, a, a bunch of teams bunched up. And the Bills lose this game. They're, they're probably outside of the playoff race with four games to go. Let's just call it what it is. I mean, who's at the top of the AFC right now? Bill Belichick. And who would potentially be coming out of the NFC? Tom Brady. I mean, look, could we get the treat of a lifetime and get Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Bucks in the Super Bowl against the New England Patriots? I know this is way too early to be talking Mm -hmm. about it, but we could talk about it right now because that's what these two conferences look like. Mm -hmm. You know, Tampa Bay is one of the best teams. New England's one of the best teams. If that's where the Super Bowl is going, sign me up. That would be one of the greatest stories in the history of sports as far as going to win a championship, uh, sign me up for that every day of the week. And Vegas right now has that as the most likely matchup. Now, it's only about, I think, 10% or so chance of that yeah. happening in Vegas. But of all the other matchups, that's the most likely at this point. Boy, that would be something else. Um, another 425 Eastern game on CBS is a good matchup between potential playoff teams and two teams coming off disappointing performances last week in the Niners and Bengals. Yeah, I think it was probably more disappointing for the 49ers and the Bengals. The Bengals game just got out of hand towards the end. You know, turnovers started to play a a factor in that. But if you look at it through really a few quarters, it wasn't like Cincinnati played that bad. It just ended up looking bad in the box score when it was all said and done. That's a concern because I think one of the things that Cincinnati got away from was running the football. Joe Mixon has a fantastic year, and I think they started to do a little bit too much there in the second half trying to throw their their way to win that game because that's what they were watching. But that's one of the things that's led to Joe Burrow leading the league in interceptions right now. You have a very capable running back. You have an offensive line that at times can be suspect of protection. Hand the football off. I don't know that they're going to be willing to do so, but I know who is, and that's the San Francisco 49ers, especially on the road. So if you're going to give me the point, I'll take it. I think these two teams are pretty evenly matched. Garoppolo didn't play great last week versus Seattle. Uh, In the end, I think San Francisco will be able to do enough to either win this game or obviously keep it within that number. Maybe we get a push. But I also think this game hits the over. Both offenses scoring a good amount in this one. Pete Prisco on the Bengals in that matchup. The Bengals well, minus one at home. Support his, his, you know. That's true. Two, yeah, Joe Burrow has got to win multiple titles. Yeah. In well, now in nine, nine years. years. Yeah. Yes. He's uh, so those are the two CBS late games, really good ones. Bills, Bucks, 49ers, Bengals. All four of those teams right now would be in the playoffs. Let's move on to the four o'clock Eastern time games over on Fox. The Giants are at the Chargers. 
It's a big number here, 10 and a half for the Chargers coming off uh, uh, the, the convincing win last week against Cincinnati. It's a big number, but one they can easily cover if Joe Lombardi just opens things up like we saw last week, you know, versus the Bengals where they let Justin Herbert throw it all around the field. That's what happens when you allow him to really let Justin Herbert cook. I don't know why we haven't made a hashtag mm -hmm. out of that yet. Uh, but the reality is the Giants, too, can't do much with their quarterback situation. Now, if Daniel Jones was to come back in this one, maybe they've got a, a shot to cover this, but it sounds more like Jake Fromm might actually be the one who starts. So if that's the case, based on how Mike Glennon looked, based on where his team's at, that man right there, Justin Herbert, he should be able to torch this secondary uh, for the New York Giants. So uh, it's a big number, but I'm delayed the 10 and a half. I don't think we're going to ride this roller coaster moving forward with the Chargers. They know what they need to do. They know they need to throw the football around the yard and score a lot of points. But as you can see, Giants past six games, look at the over-under. you got to like the under in this one. That's because I don't think the Giants are going to score many points. Yeah, that's looking like Army-Navy games. Those two teams have gone under, I think, 15 straight uh, yeah. matchups. And they, they play again on Saturday. Uh, over-under for that game 34, 34 by the way. Yeah. Lowest of the season in college football. Take the under. That's the way things have been going. Uh, one more game at 4 o'clock Eastern time, just after the 4 o'clock hour, 4.05. The Lions coming off a win in Denver. You know, I, I, I said I would never pick them the rest of the year. I just, I, it was such an awesome moment yeah. to watch, you know, Jared Goff, final seconds, hit Amara St. Brown for the win. And then who did he run to? Right Dan to Campbell. Coach, yeah. Right to his coach. You know, they kind of shared in that moment. We've seen Dan Campbell get emotional. It's because people have a hard time understanding the amount of effort, sacrifice, and time that you put into this in your life, and you're pouring yourself out for all these other players, and that team plays hard. And look at the record against the spread. So, so I'm a fool for not trusting what I saw earlier in the year and wanting to stick with this team, because they keep a fight in every single game. I don't think they win this game. I do think they keep it close. Like Denver's got some issues too, it's in particular in their play calling. You know, Pat Sherman's all over the place, and at times you see them take shots and be more aggressive down the field, but you know, it seems like that, that's too far in, in between, and, and it really didn't do much last week versus Kansas City. So uh, bottom line is, I think Denver wins this game, but Lions will keep it within the number. I do think it will be the under when it's all said and done. This secondary for the Broncos can match up with anyone. I think they'll match up with a you know, somewhat lack of talent on the side of the Detroit Lions. Uh, so again, Lions don't win, but low scoring game. I'm, I'm saying literally first one at 20 may win. <laughs> Broncos need a win to stay in that uh, playoff race in the AFC at 6-6 six and six going into this one. Let's recap the late afternoon games on Sunday. Brady Quinn and Pete Prisco giving us picks. Uh, disagreement on the Bills and Bucks. Disagreement on San Francisco and Cincinnati. But they both like the Chargers minus 10.5 against the Giants. And the Lions plus 8 in Denver. Moving on to the primetime games. I don't know why we keep putting Bears in, in primetime key spots. That's the biggest number of the week. Bears plus 12 and a half against the Packers. Justin Fields returning in that game. Really good Monday nighter though. The Rams and Cardinals. Arizona in that one spot in the NFC. A game ahead of the Packers and the Bucks. Uh, they are giving three at home. Let's start with the Sunday nighter and Justin Fields making his return to the starting position. For I don't even know if that's such a good thing for the way this, this Bears offense, the position they're in right now. Andy Dalton played Terrible last week, what, four, four interceptions, obviously, that, that led to just a, a trouncing from the Arizona Cardinals. But the position that he's in is, you know, you just want to see improvement. You want to see steady improvement. The problem is you're worried about his, his health and concern, especially with a rib injury. So uh, I feel pretty confident in the Packers at home being able to cover a ginormous number at 12 and a half points. But Aaron Rodgers has absolutely owned the Bears. Is this his last game as a member of the Packers facing the Bears? Please tell me it is. Yeah, I was going to say, as a Bears fan, you <laughs> should feel pretty safe in knowing that he'll probably be somewhere else. Hell, if he ends up with the Denver Broncos next year, look for the Broncos to make a run for a Super Bowl because that's the only thing that, that yeah. roster is missing. But for all intents and purposes for this matchup, they should have no issue whatsoever. They're, their team's actually getting healthier, too. Uh, by the way, so the Packers are starting to kind of ascend. Rodgers coming come off a little extra rest, too, with that toe injury that should be of too much concern. He was still pretty mobile, moving around even with the injury. So uh, this is one where lay the 12 and a half points, don't even think about it. And, and I think this game hits the over because the Packers are going to put up that many points. And the Packers should keep the pressure on the Arizona Cardinals. By winning that game, they put pressure on Arizona on Monday Night Football to win, to stay in first place in the NFC. Arizona is at home against a Rams team. It's, uh, they've had chances over the last month, five, six weeks or so, 
to show that they're the team we thought that they might be, and they've struggled against really good teams. Right, not versus bad teams like we saw last week yeah, versus right. Jacksonville. So maybe that was like helping to kind of get their mojo back together. This is going to be a tough challenge. I mean, bottom line, you know, Kyler Murray didn't have to do much last week because their offense kept getting the football in advantageous positions with all the turnovers from the Bears. He'll be tested more in this one. I mean, the divisional matchup, that's always the case, but especially with the personnel they have up front. So I'm looking for the Cardinals to be able to cover this spread three points. But there's also the potential of push. I mean, this is going to be a close win. But what we learned when Kyler Murray was out was this is just a good football team. I mean, whether he's in there or not, they can win football games because of that defense, because of some of the other weapons they have, even their ability to run the football, which I don't think many people thought when Cliff Kingsbury first got there, they'd be willing to do that. So I'm on the side of the Cardinals here. I do think this will be a lower scoring game, too, at 51 and a half points. Uh, I just I have a hard time believing the Rams are going to be able to put up a ton of points versus that Cardinals defense that can get pressure and cover down on the outside, even with their big win last week versus the Jaguars. Pete did pick the total on this one, and it's lock unity. Oh, there you, you go. You guys agree Cardinals yeah. and under is the play. Well, at least I'm not locked up in jury duty like he is right oh now. Oh, my God. Poor Pete. Yeah. Um, I, I, He's probably I, I, sequestered somewhere, right? Yeah, and he can't. Can you imagine being take away your stuck phones? in a room with Pete Prisco for hours at That's, a time? Look, if this could be a hung jury, uh, let's just let's just be honest here, right? I mean, there's no way they're agreeing on anything with Pete in the room. He'll take the other side just for the hell of it. That's what I'm saying. I mean, by the way, he'll be flip flopping back and forth like he does on this <laughs> show, and it'll get to the point where everyone's so confused, no one can make any decision. The old flip flopper, Pete Prisco. Hope to have him back next week again. He's uh, fine. He claims stay in he's there, on jury duty. Stay in the, stay sequestered. Uh, the buys this week. Patriots, Dolphins, Colts, Eagles. It's the final buy of the season, Greg. Yep. Getting and down to it. You're worried for the Patriots. So much momentum right yeah. now. Could that maybe throw a wrench into everything Seven they've straight Seven straight. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, that's Brady Quinn. I'm Chris Hassel. Our thanks to Pete Frisco for emailing in his picks before Jury Duty hit. Thanks for watching, everybody. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.